If we had a healthily functioning regulatory system, a society that did not allow corporations to do whatever the hell that they want, those things would not happen in the first place. That is the problem. Maximilian Alvarez is the editor-in-chief of The Real News Network, host of the Working People podcast, friend of the show, voice of the show. <laughs> Thanks right. for taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks for having me, brothers. Great to see you, as always. Great to see you. Um, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that it is under these circumstances because the circumstances are not great. Uh, there has been uh, just a, a genuinely, you know, catastrophic accident in Baltimore uh, that has, um, by all accounts, taken at least six lives and, and six lives of immigrants. Um, and and I'm not sure if there are expectations that the death toll is, is going to be rising at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, on top of that, you know, the obvious and, and the thing that should be at the center, and, and we want to put that at the center, there are, of course, huge other ramifications because this bridge was really kind of the connecting artery to the Baltimore port that's one of the largest in the United States. The Longshoremen's Association there said that, that they are um, concerned that there's going that their 2400 members are going to be out of a job soon. Uh, uh, you know boats are having to you know these cargo carriers are are anchoring outside of the port, unable to dock because they can't get their stuff, you know, what it would have gone across the bridge to the rest of the U.S. And so this is, you know, just a huge, huge situation um, with with really serious uh, uh, ramifications for the entire city of Baltimore. So just let, let's start there and then we can dive into some of the specific aspects and, and maybe some of the reactions to it. Um, Generally, 30,000 foot view, how is this feeling to people in Baltimore as a resident of Baltimore yourself? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll walk through the timeline of this week, right? And, um, you know, and just to, to kind of let folks know, um, you know, it's been a very long week and I just got like, you know, more than five hours of sleep for the first night in like a week and a half. Um, so it's kind of all hitting me now. Like, you know, I was just along with our team at The Real News, racing all over the city, doing everything we could to meet the moment and and uh, lift up the voices of the people who are going to be quickly forgotten in all of this, right? And, um, you know, the, the workers who perish, their families, their community, our community, uh, as you said, the the workers on the port, the workers on that ship who are probably going to be stuck there for weeks. And and there's another issue there about uh, if we're talking about invisible workers, you know, like these these immigrant construction workers who were filling potholes on the key bridge when uh, the ship, uh, the dolly hit the uh, load bearing pylon and collapsed the bridge. Um, you know, the workers on that ship, you know, are are, are also, you know, incredibly uh, exploited and we don't know a whole lot about them but what we do know is that you know like as as maritime trades uh union folks here in the states have told me i mean like you you have a lot of these ships that are effectively and i quote floating sweatshops that mm. workers from the global south are living on and working in and and have no escape from for months on end right so there there's a whole lot of horror tied up in this story that we're going to need to unpack for for you know the the weeks and months to come um but but as you said jacob i mean like the 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 very fact of the bridge collapsing uh in the port of baltimore i mean is going to have you know huge ramifications for working people in the baltimore area but beyond it too it's going to have ramifications for our economy after workers have been, you know, battered for years by COVID, by inflation, and so on and so forth. So there, there, it, it, this is going to, yeah, be a very devastating event um, for the city and for our our, our people uh, for, for a long time to come. But, you know, when I got, I, I got back to Baltimore myself uh, at 1.30 on Monday morning, after driving, you know, uh, six hours back from East Palestine, Ohio. 
uh, where I had been <clears throat> for the previous five days running around filming for the real news, uh, participating in uh, an event that, that you know, we helped put together along with just this incredible coalition of folks that that have come together and came together there physically in East Palestine last Saturday, a week away, a week from today. We're talking East Palestine residents who have been, you know, like uh, whose lives have been turned upside down by the catastrophic Norfolk Southern train derailment on February 3rd of last year. That, too, was a preventable catastrophe. Um, and, you know, the the workers there, the people there, these are current and former union members uh, like Chris Albright, the the one of the, the residents that I've been working most closely with and have gotten close to with his and, and his family. He's an incredible guy, beautiful family. You know, he was an oil. Uh, he was a gas pipeline worker. Uh, he was a foreman. He was a Layuna member, is a Layuna member. Mm. And then a month after the derailment, you know, uh, like we can we can almost you know, completely surmised, but because of all the like legal deniability, like, you know, doctors are even afraid to say for sure. But a month after this derailment, a healthy, able bodied pipeline worker um, was experiencing congestive heart failure that developed into severe heart failure. Um, and he can no longer work. His medical bills are piling up. He, as of this year, he's lost his health insurance. So, like, these folks are are in an incredibly dire situation. And we were there along with residents, railroad workers, uh, residents from other sacrifice zones like Piketon, Ohio, where they've been getting poisoned by a nuclear plant for 40 years. Um, you know, residents living near other rail lines saying we don't want this to happen to us. And like, we're coming here to stand in solidarity with you. Striking journalists from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, environmental groups, people from West Virginia, California, Baltimore, like coming in to assemble there to answer the call in East Palestine and say, like, you're not Trump voters. You know, we're not we're not anything but fellow workers, fellow human beings who are fighting for our families and our communities. And we are here to help you. And we want to stand with you. But we all need to stand together if we're going to stop this crap because it's happening all over the country. Doesn't matter if you're in a Democrat or Republican state. Corporate America is poisoning, exploiting, and taking advantage, taking advantage of all of us right now. And we are the kind of forgotten victims of this, you know, 40 plus year reign of uh, corporate uh, oligarchy and, you know, like neoliberal crap um, that, that has like contributed to the decades long process of the Wall Street takeover of, uh, you know, vital industries like the railroads, um, the, the profit minded, um, you know, uh, the profit obsession, um, le leading to like a, 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 an obsession, an obsession for juicing short-term profits while stripping away long-term maintenance and safety provisions, stripping away staff, cutting costs, cutting corners every year. Uh, and the railroads are more profitable than they've ever been. And yet mm. communities like East Palestine and workers like those on the railroads are the ones paying the price. I promise I'm getting to Baltimore, but like the point is, is that's what I was doing this weekend. And I drove back, you know, on Sunday night, got home late Monday morning, thinking about all of this, thinking about those conversations, thinking about our brothers and sisters in East Palestine. And then uh, the first thing I did on Tuesday morning was I went on Flash Forenses show, America's Workforce. Shout out to Flash and the great folks there. I know you guys got a phenomenal regular spot there, too. Chris Albright and I went back on Flash's show Tuesday morning, like at seven in the morning to talk about the East Palestine Conference. And as soon as that was done, I started learning about the bridge. Hey, five seconds. Just wanted to say that this is only possible because of our donors. If you want to see more of this, then consider donating yourself at tvlr.fm slash donate. Mm. Um, and the first texts that I started getting about the bridge were from East Palestine residents who felt really connected and feel really connected to Baltimore right now. And there's something really powerful in that, but we can return to that later. But, you know, they were seeing a lot of 
uh, eerie resonances with what they had been through. I couldn't help but see them too. And I want to be clear, as I said in, in the piece I wrote for The Nation this week, like Baltimore is not East Palestine. These situations are not exactly the same, but they do, I think, uh, reveal like common issues that working people around this country are feeling. And the 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 sources of those issues uh, uh, we also have in common, right? Because you know what as we know I mean, I'll get I'll get to that in a second. But as we know, um, and as you said, like basically at one thirty, around one thirty on on Tuesday morning, um, this this um, uh, uh, ship, the freight ship that was um, leaving the port of Baltimore uh, had left, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes um, prior to experiencing a catastrophic propulsion failure. Um, issuing uh, the captain, you know, like, or the pilot on that ship, you know, like that, who is uh, a, an American um, designated official who is supposed to uh, help uh, ships navigate their way out of the port, to Bal port of Baltimore. Um, they issued a mayday call when they experienced that failure, um, uh, letting the, the emergency dispatch know that there was a chance that the ship could hit the bridge. Uh, and then they had about 90 seconds to respond. And so, you know, police, you can listen to the police scanner, uh, the folks responding to that call, racing to the key bridge, blocking traffic. So more people uh, didn't drive onto that bridge before it collapsed and credit to them. They saved lives. Um, but, you know, like the workers, the construction workers who were filling potholes, on that bridge in the middle of the night, um, we're, we're working for a contractor in the city named Bronner Builders. It's a non-union contractor. Um, you know, they did not get a warning. Or I mean, like by all accounts, we we have not found any evidence that they got any warning. And that's kind of where like my reporting in this, you know, came in is um, after the America's Workforce interview. Uh, you know, I went to the Real News Network. I, I was talking to our colleagues, our team about, you know, what we knew and what we could do. Um, two of my amazing colleagues, Kayla Rivara and Jocelyn Dombrowski, our, our um, chief of editorial operations and our managing editor. We just we got in the car. I grabbed my podcast stuff and I said, let, 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 let's go and, and try to get as close as we can. And so we ended up at this Royal Farms gas station. It's a really famous kind of Maryland chain um, Tuck, uh, uh, Justin Tucker, the kicker for the Baltimore Ravens does the commercials for them. So, uh, I was standing there with my colleagues and, you know, seeing media run around, uh, at, at this Royal farms that is like right next to the end, one of the entrances to the bridge. And, uh, we were racing there because we had seen on social media that a man named Jesus Campos was there. Jesus also works for Bronner Builders, uh, is also an immigrant uh, worker, construction worker, uh, who, you know, was saying that he knew the men on that bridge. So we were mm -hmm. racing primarily to meet him. And we did. And I got to interview Jesus for, you know, between three and four minutes. Um, but it was really troubling to me because the whole time we were racing there, and uh, I was trying to find out everything I could about the situation. I was looking at uh, the posts and and articles from other journalists who had spoken to Jesus. And when we got there, I asked him a question that I felt I hadn't heard anyone else ask it up until that point. Uh, I'm not saying no one did, but I hadn't heard it, which was, you know, did the workers get a warning um, before the, the bridge collapsed? And he told me pretty, pretty uh, point blankly, no. Um, and that to me, you know, is is a, an egregious injustice, right? And there's so many questions again that are wrapped up in that. Like, how in the hell could we end up in a situation where workers doing this essential work, um, contracting with the state, um, and the and those contracts are supposed, especially in construction, are supposed to mandate um, a, a prevailing union wages. Um, and you know, again, this is not a, a union contractor. So far, what I've heard from other construction folks in the city is that Bronner like doesn't have the worst reputation. So like I don't want to speak out of turn and and blame the company for everything before I can do more investigating. But you know, the 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 facts are that it's a non-union contractor, that the state of Maryland, like states around the country, um, you know, like uh uh, uh use these sort of these 
uh, contractors and those contractors subcontract workers out. And that very well could have been the situation on Tuesday where some of these workers were, you know, subcontracted, um, being paid under the table, possibly even undocumented. Again, these are the questions that we're trying to find out. But right now, uh, first and foremost, we're trying to give the family space because they are grieving an incredible mm -hmm. and impossible loss. Some of these men just welcome new children into their family mm -hmm. in the past year. And now those families have a hole in it that'll never be filled. So anyway, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'll, I'll wrap this up. The, the point being is that I interviewed Jesus Campos. You know, I, I, I posted about the fact that according to uh, one of the co-workers of these men uh, who died on the bridge, they did not receive uh, a warning. Um, if they were, you know, city workers, if they were union workers, um, would they have had a direct line to emergency dispatch? Uh, if not, why the hell do we have uh, a, a regulatory regime that allows workers to be marooned on a ship like that in a clearly potentially hazardous environment? Doing that vital work, and con let's not forget, construction's already one of the deadliest jobs in America, uh, and they had no direct line to emergency dispatch in case something like this happened. Like, that in itself is an egregious injustice. And the only other thing I'll say, just tying it back to East Palestine, is, like, again, these situations are not the same, but a lot of the common, like, uh, questions are coming up. Uh, like, with Norfolk Southern and the train derailment, like, you know, the, the when when that derailment happened, right, immediately you had all of these like, you know, well to do pundits in the United States saying like, well, you know, we can't rush to conclusions. All we know is that it appears to be a bearing failure that that caused the derailment. So that's all we can say on it right now. Just like mm -hmm. the same folks today are saying, well, all we know is that it was a propulsion failure. So we can't rush to conclusions. And I'm not rushing to conclusions. We need to do the investigative work like that's what journalism is supposed to do. But. Again, the, the point that I'm making here and the point that seems so obvious to not just me, but folks in East Palestine and folks who've been paying attention to things like East Palestine, to things like Boeing, right, to things like BP, right? I mean, like what to the railroads, right? I mean, like what we are seeing is like a fracturing of the basic social contract in this country, which was, you know, like supposed to be between the citizens, labor, business and government. To say, like, look, all of this, like, dangerous, uh, you know, crap that is that and machinery that is operating in our backyards, in our communities, these railroads that are running through our backyards and our towns, right? These sh massive uh, uh, um, shipping vessels that are passing by our homes and over our the water that we use in this in this uh, city, like. We the social contract is that like we need to have uh, layers of protection and maintenance in place that are not driven by profit, but that are there and exist solely to ensure that things like this don't happen. So the very fact of the bridge collapse, the very fact of the Norfolk Southern train derailment, the very fact of the two Boeing planes that went out of the sky and killed hundreds of people uh, with them, the very fact of the BP oil spill, and I could go on and on and on, like that is the problem. Like if we had a healthily functioning regulation regulatory system, if we actually had a society that did not allow corporations to do whatever the hell that they want, like those things would not happen in the first place. That is the problem. You just saw a clip from the Valley Labor Report. We are live every Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. And we pride ourselves on keeping all of our content free to everybody so that we can talk to as many working folks as possible. If you support the work that we're doing, you think that it's important, you think that it's good, then consider making a monthly contribution to the project. And you can do that on our website, tvlr.fm. 